All right, kids, you can go back. Okay, I got to tell you the inside joke here, okay? <laughs> Misty's going to kill me. She goes, when you go up there, please do not yell to turn up the lights. I'm going to have them there before you get to the pulpit. And I said, all right. So that's why I was like, good job, you got the lights. Oh, hey, seriously. Seriously, if you want the enemy out of your life, if you want things to change, if you want to walk in the presence of the Lord, if you want all the things you hear about, it's got to start with your worship, all right? It's got to start with your worship. If you want to send the enemy flying out of your family, out of your emotions and all that, and you want the healing process to begin, it's got to start with worship. You know why? Because the enemy is not going to stick around and listen to you praise God, right? He hates that. Why? Because he wants your praise. The enemy wants your praise. He wants your worship. He wants your distraction. He wants to amplify your burden and worry. You can't have any of that when you're worshiping God. It seems to just fall off, you know. Uh, and, and I want this to be a culture where, where we don't care what the enemy wants anymore. We don't care what our neighbor's looking at. We, we just want, he came to set the captives free, right? Why don't we enjoy freedom? I'm not asking you to run up and down. I'm just asking you to worship. Don't be afraid to sing, right? All you are singing are like to the radio and are in the shower. I know it. Everybody does. So let's sing to the Lord, right? That was good, by the way. That gave me Jesus bumps. They're not goosebumps in church. They're Jesus bumps. So, All right. How y'all doing? Well, I just went southwest Missouri and said y'all, so we should feel comfortable now. Amen. I'm glad you guys are here. I, I don't tell you that enough. You could have spent your Sunday anywhere today doing anything you want to do, but you chose to be in the Lord's house, and that's encouraging for someone like me. It's hard to get up here and talk, and no one's listening, you know. Uh, so I appreciate you here. The Lord loves it that you're here. He wants to work in your life. He wants to to watch you step into the destiny He has for you and fulfill that purpose that you were created for, right? Anybody believe that besides me? Yep. All right. God has a plan for you. So today, the calendar says that uh, December 25th is coming up soon, right? Uh, you all ate your turkey last week, didn't you? Yeah, a few of you. Some of you are not telling the truth. Some of us are still eating the turkey from last week. Uh, so we've ate our turkey. We've ate, we ate the desserts. We went to Black Friday. Now we're all broke, right? Uh, normal people, after last Thursday, after Black Friday, normal people started decorating for Christmas. Amen? All right, there's a written rule. You don't decorate for Christmas until after Thanksgiving. People, if we don't stick to this rule, some of you, Josiah, are going to be putting up Christmas lights in July, all right? It's too soon. So we started three weeks ago putting up Christmas stuff. We're not normal, uh, never have been. My wife said, well, it was probably a couple weeks ago, she goes, climb up in the attic, right? We got a little hole about the size of this speaker. Climb up there and get a treat about the size of that one. Out of the attic, get the lights on. That's how my wife talks to me, if you guys want to pray for your pastor, right? <laughs> Is she back there? Security? Anyway, climb up in the tree and get the attic. She didn't say it that hateful, but that's how I heard it, dadgummit, right? She goes, no one does Christmas lights, uh, lights on the tree like you, honey, which means that I don't want to do the lights, so you're doing them, honey, right? It's manipulation. Are we still clear, Daniel? Security? Okay. And I said, you know what I said, guys? I said, I'm not doing it. I even went Jesus on her. It's the Sabbath. I'm resting. I'm not doing Christmas today. I'm watching football. I worked all week. I'm just going to lay here on the couch and relax. It's relax day, honey. So we compromised, and I went and got the tree down. That's how we compromised. My son, Dagan, me and him got it down, put on lights. Caleb helped a little bit, and we got to experience that Christmas joy together, right? Um, I'm sorry, guys. I am so over Christmas trees. Not Christmas, but Christmas trees, right? You see all these trees up here and out there? I didn't do any of them. I laid on the stage and complained for two hours, right? No more trees. And it's not really the trees. It, it is the lights. Who hangs Christmas lights, right? All right, you better not have a tree in your house and not raise your hand. One bulb goes out and half the tree goes out, right? And you spend four hours, or getting better, right? You can buy those 
$400 LED lights. It's getting better, but you have to search. Does anybody really search for hours trying to find that one bulb that's out, or you just throw it away and go get new ones? Some of you do. I don't. I would like stupid lights. They're from the devil, and I throw them away, and I go get new ones, right? It's the lights. Take hours to find what is wrong with it, and it gets this you guys know what I'm talking about. I've talked about it before. That feely feeling in the pit of your stomach where you're just like, there's no words for it. It's just like, Ugh! one of those times. That's what the lights, it's freak out mode for me, those lights. And my wife always looks at me and says, honey, where's your Christmas spirit, right? And I'm just like, it's gone. It left as soon as I plugged it in and the lights didn't work. A lot of things this time of year can do that to you. Or is it just me? Does your pastor, is he the only one in here that has problems, right? Yeah. Yes. All right, just for that, I'm going to start judging you and pointing them out. I know you. We all went to school together, grew up together, so, all right, be careful. Kelby learned that lesson last week. Pastor gets the last word on Sundays. Uh, shopping. I don't handle shop. I do have problems. I don't handle shopping well either. Planning. Any of you guys plan your Christmases, right? All right, we set it up this date, this time. Well, I can't be there. Okay, we'll switch it to this date, this time. Well, I can't be there. Switch it to this date, and you're just like, ah, Merry Christmas, right? Open the letter. I don't do that either. My wife does that and my mom does that. Decorating, traveling, you know, if we're not careful, we really never get to enjoy Christmas, right? As a pastor, I get stressed out. I've already showed you about other things I get stressed out, but just being delivering a message, Christmas message, right? Because of expectations, you know, every church, every Christmas, everybody's talking about baby Jesus, everybody's talking about the manger and the wise man, it's time for Christmas sermons, and that puts, I don't know why traditional stuff puts pressure on me, probably because I'm not traditional and I'm just so far outside the box, I'm a Christian rebel, doesn't really exist, I just call myself that, right? Traditional stuff, I feel like the pressure where I have to do a certain thing at a certain time. So I'm been to my wife the other day and saying, what am I going to talk about Christmas, right? How many times can you do the baby Jesus and, and the star and the shepherds? You know, Who's heard that story? Be honest, since you was a kid. Maybe I should have done it. Half of you have no clue. Okay. I still, like I, I still like it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I still like it, but we've heard it. We don't remember it, but we, but we heard it, right? How do we, I, I look at myself, I say, how do I make that relevant? You know, I kind of like look, looking through scriptures and, and making it relevant in our lives, things that I've gone through, right? How do I put that twist on it that will cause you to think? See, that's what I try to do. I want you to leave here thinking, right? I want you to leave here searching. I want you to leave here going, man, Brant said something and I'm going to look it up because, you know, I've never heard that, right? What am I going to do? And my wife is just looking at me and like I'm crazy because I am. And my daughter, she's over there, seven years old. She's eavesdropping, she's, which is a nice way of saying she's sticking her nose in my business, right? She's listening to our conversation. This is an adult conversation. You need to be doing something else. And she really thinks she belongs there in that conversation. And she goes, Dad, it's easy. Just tell them about the purpose of Christmas, right? And at first I said, Braley. You need to mind your own business, all right? No one, you know, you, let me stress out here a little bit on my own. I don't need you helping me. But I thought about it, and she was right. The purpose of Christmas, a lot of people are going to miss that, right? They have plans. They have plans. They, 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 they have presents. Presents, the gift, not presents of the Lord. They have food. They have good times of family. But they miss the very purpose of of Christmas. And we talk about it. We talk about it, especially in church settings, right? We talk about what happened. We talk about the Virgin Mary. We, we talk about the struggle that the family goes through to find a place to have Jesus. We talk about the shepherds and the wise men. We, we make that the story of Christmas. And that is only part of the story of Christmas. But the substance of the message is missed. The why. Why did it happen? That's how I read the Bible, right? Not questioning God, but I'll read something like, why'd you do that? Why did you put that in there, right? My sister gave a sermon the other day. Why did you put, he chased a lion into the pit? Because that sounds odd. Why? Why? 
was Mary in the position to have Jesus in the manger, right? I'm going to start out, I want to read a verse, and then I'm going to explain what it means. This is not a traditional Christmas verse. You guys are making me nervous. No, <laughs> we should. And someone's going to say, well, there's no baby Jesus there. You're right, we have three weeks. I'm going to get you your baby Jesus in there, okay? Um, but we're going to be in just, I want to read this out of Galatians. And this is Paul talking to uh, the Galatians, of course. 419, chapter 4, verse 19. And it says, oh, my dear children. How would you like for me to come in here and talk to you guys like this? Kids, listen up, right? That's what Paul's doing here. He goes, oh, my dear children, I feel like I am going through labor pains for your for you again. That means he's done this before. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Okay? I admit, this is the strangest way to start a Christmas-type sermon ever. I probably set a record here, right? None of the traditional stuff. And we're talking about Paul, which is a guy and labor pains, which was kind of odd too, right? I've always said if guys had to give birth, we would be an endangered species. There would be like three of us here, right? That's a joke. You can laugh. You girls are tougher than me. I don't want it. You got the prize, all right? (laughs) Paul is trying to communicate how much it hurts to not see Christ developing in people he cares for, okay? Okay? Not that Christ isn't in their life, because Christ is in their life. They are the church of Galatia. They, Christ is there. They know the message. They come in. They gather. But church says, or Paul says, but I don't see Christ fully developing in you. I don't see, and some of you are going to like, what are you talking about, Pastor? Right? He doesn't see the fruit of change. He doesn't see the fruit of life. He doesn't see that gift of authority that is rising up with them. The church is probably still freaking out. How are we going to do this? And they're probably part-timers, and they're probably walking in the world. And he goes, I know you like Jesus, and we do this thing, but I just don't see Christ fully, fully, that's the word we're concentrating on, developing developing that word by itself doesn't mean perfect it doesn't mean that you've arrived it doesn't mean that you are there it says I don't see you growing and it's killing Paul right don't worry guys I'm not Paul today I'm not experiencing labor pains and I'm not claiming to because one of you could stand up you don't even know pastor you're right don't want to right And you ask yourself today, what's this verse have to do with me and with Christmas? I want to start by sharing the title. I don't know if this is a sermon. I don't know what we do if this is a sermon or this is just where I'm preaching from or talking, right? Sermon sounds so dignified, and that's not me. I'm not traditional, right? I have fun up here. But the sermon of our, or (laughs) subject of our talk today, will Christmas even come? Okay? I'm fully aware that December 25th will come, right? And we're going to do that stuff. We're going to trade gifts. Gifts are awesome. I like trading gifts. I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing. I like dinners with family. You know what? We even talk about the chubby red guy that comes down the chimney, which we don't have, so he sneaks in other ways. I don't know. I can't explain that one, right? Right? Now, some people in church would be like, you're missing the point. No, no, I'm, I'm having fun with my kids. They know the reason for the season, right? But I'm not going to go extreme the other way and say we can't have fun, right? And some of you may disagree, and that's cool, right? I'm not going to try to be over the top about Christmas. My kids know, right? And we're going to do all these things, and we're going to have fun with it. And December 25th, the festivities will begin, and that's going to be great. But will Christmas truly come to your hearts, to your house, to your family this year? And to understand what I'm asking you, you have to understand the purpose of Christmas. Okay? Someone give me amen something. I just need to know you're here, all right? Thank you. Helps me out. You hurt my feelings. I want to read you from Luke, right? Chapter 4 today. Luke 4, verses 14 and 15. I will be reading from the NIV today. Switch it up, right? 
I usually read from the NLT. Never mind, I'm not going to explain that. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Do you understand Jesus is all God and the Holy Spirit is all God and God's all God? They're three in one, right? But something happened. Jesus never performed a miracle. He never did anything until the day of his baptism. And the baptism was that time that the Holy Spirit, John said, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. Now there's power in the Spirit, right? Jesus was all God, all humanity, but he was also, did I say all God? He was all man, humanity, but he was also all God, all deity, right? He is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is him. He didn't have to have the Spirit fall on him to do what he had to do, but Jesus came to this earth to be an example of what me and you should do. He says, you need to do this. You need to get saved. You need to get baptized, and you need to be filled with the Spirit. Now watch the mighty power begin. Amen? Amen. That's an amen. Right? You need the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, here we go, back to reading. It says, He returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit's already on Him. And the news about Him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised Him. You see, Jesus has preached a few times. He, he has talked with people. Uh, his full ministry is just about to kick off. He's done some miracles, and people loved Him. You see, at this point, Jesus was a rock star. Jesus, everybody wanted to see what the hype was about this man that everybody's talking about. They're flocking to him. So far, this is what I'm trying to say. So far, Jesus hasn't invaded anybody's personal space and he hasn't offended anybody. There's no one that wants him dead yet. Right? You know how many times humanity has tried to kill Jesus? Took him out of the schools. Taken him out of the courtroom. Right? Right? They don't like that feeling that they have when they encounter Jesus. Why? Because then they suddenly realize that they're not in control. So Jesus hasn't offended anybody, right? But these next few verses, what he's about to say is about to change history forever. Okay? Jesus is always welcome until he tries to make changes in our lives. Right? Right? You know what I mean? We love the gifts. We love salvation. We love the thought of living forever and eternity in a place where there's no pain. We love that stuff. But when Jesus starts to invade our secret places, we're like, whoa, that's enough Jesus for today, right? Pastor, you're meddling. I know. He told me to, right? You're stepping on my toes. I wouldn't have to if you'd take off the steel-toed boots. Amen? The true change, the giving up the things that our flesh likes, the change in our angers, the change in the way we think, right? We're pretty accustomed to us and the things of this world, and we like it. You know why sin and temptation look so good? Because we like it. And for a while, it is good. Until it kills you. Anyway, don't get personal, Jesus. Luke 4, 16 and 17. It says, he went to Nazareth. Home, homeboy is coming back to his hometown, right? Where he grew up. It says where he had been brought up. See, I didn't lie to you. It's right there in the Word. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. Stop right there. He went to the synagogue as his custom. You know what that's saying, church? For those of you who say you don't need to go to church, Jesus went to church as his Jesus Christ All God went to church as his custom every week. He made it a point, right? You're telling me you don't need it, but Jesus found importance in it and he needed it, right? Man, I am stepping on toes. Anyway, he stood up to read. He participated in church. Okay, too personal. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, what's those next words? Was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it is written. We're going to stop right there. Jesus comes home, right? Imagine this. I leave here for a few years, and I come home, and I walk in here because I love Engaged Church. I love you guys, and I walk up here, and and the new pastor says, here, Brant, read this, and hands me a scroll, right? I said, cool, I'll read it, and and I start to read. Notice that Jesus did not go to a box and search through Scripture. I I want you to see the divine appointment here, all right? How God works everything out, 
right? He didn't dig through Scripture to find the one that was convenient to the message he wanted to send, amen? He was given it to him by another person. Another person, it may have been planned by them, but Jesus is just now getting there, right? This is new for him. Walks in, he says, here's your scroll, read this. This is what he said. This is what he reads. 18 and 21. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's reading this from the scroll. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. The King James adds in here, to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery for their sights for the blind. So he's to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right? He walks in, he reads it, hands it back, sits down, and says, Yep, that's me. Right? Whoa. You're breaking, you're breaking all the rules, Jesus. Right? So you're claiming to be what Isaiah wrote about. You're, you're the Savior. You're the Messiah, right? Guys, it all started with the baby in the manger. Of course it did. This is our God. This is our God that took on flesh and bone. This is our God. I heard yesterday, I went to the James River Christian. The most powerful thing that Jesus did is not create the world. It's not speaking in everything into existence. It's not even dying on the cross for our sins. The most powerful thing he did in the world, in the heavens, the most powerful thing that Jesus did is leave where he was at in heaven and become flesh and become vulnerable to everything you're susceptible to. To purposely say, I will do this for them. Right? Think about that. He left. He became flesh. He became bones. He became vulnerable so that you would have a chance to live life the way it was tended, attended. Amen? This is the purpose of, Christi- or of Christmas and Christianity. Amen. Amen? It was told to Joseph, you'll have a child and you will name him Jesus. You will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if you get through this season, if you get through Christmas is a 365 thing, day, a year thing. Right? Basically, Jesus was handed a 700-year-old scripture. That's when Isaiah wrote it, 700 years before, and said, this is me, right? Not the Christmas we come to know on December 25th. Not, not, not the stress out, not the crazy time, not the I'm broken, how am I going to do this? Not the fight with other crazy people at the mall, not to dread the time that you have to sit down with crazy Aunt Sally for two hours. If you have a crazy Aunt Sally or you are a crazy Aunt Sally, I apologize for offending you. Right? But you know what I'm talking about? I've got to run, I've got to do, and this is, oh my gosh, I can't do it. You missed it. The real purpose is the love that Jesus Christ showed for you. And if you are no different than you are before the encounter, you missed it. Because Christmas comes and the purpose happens. When you come in contact with Christ, you heard me say it a thousand times, it changes everything. He comes home and he sits on the stage and he just created an atmosphere. See, Jesus sits in a warm, comfortable feeling that we've grown into what it should be. Jesus will shake you up. He will stir you up. Break your comfortable seat because he wants you to be uncomfortable so you don't depend on yourself and you got to depend on him. And he says, that's me. Right? And if you don't change at that point, right? That's why I say thousands of people this year are going to miss Christmas. Completely. 
And that question in my head, the question why I do this, I do this for Jesus, but, but, but he's, he's impressed on my heart. That question, well, Christmas comes, follows another question in my heart. What if it doesn't come for them? It's came for me. What if it doesn't come for my children? And what if it doesn't come for my children's children? What if it doesn't come for those that are sitting out there listening to me? What if it doesn't come? It scares me to death, right? Especially when it's made so easy. Especially when the answer came and made himself available time after time after time again. That easy, right? Jesus said, it's me. This is fulfilled. And the world at that point changed forever. Right? He came to give you a chance and he died to give you a life. And that's why Paul said in Galatians, Galatians again, oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your life. So I'm not going to stop. Right? If I get on your nerves, so be it. I'm not going to stop. Right? That should be our motto, right? Let's make some t-shirts. Let's put it on, on our cars. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop until Christ is fully developed in my workplace, in my school, in my life, in my family. I'm not going to stop when frustration. I'm not going to stop when I'm tired. I'm not going to stop. Right? I will continue until Christ is fully developed, right? I hate seeing people with no hope. I hate seeing people that are broken, that are held captive. Why? Because I've been there. I hate seeing people that are blind to the truth. The most dangerous pray, prayer I ever prayed was, God, let me see through your eyes. I didn't realize the weight or the burden that would put on me. Right? But it's that weight and that burden that I give back to Jesus that gives me the strength and the power to do it time and time again. Amen. Our greatest need for Christmas this year is to have Jesus formed into us, right? Several times it says in the New Testament to be seated in Christ Jesus, not with Christ Jesus, right? In means that we're a part of each other. In means that he is in me. He's not by me. He's not behind me. He's not in front of me. He is. He's everywhere. He's God. He can do that. Not going to explain that one. But he's also in me. Right? That's why nothing can separate me from him and his love. Amen? Except when I decide to take him off. Not going there either. Should have been there on Wednesday night. Once saved, always saved. We need Jesus in us to be formed in us, to heal us, to teach us, to guide us, to love us, to show us how to forgive one another because that is difficult, right? Not going to lie. We need him in us so I can love you the way he loves you and you can love me the way he loves me, right? To get rid of our division, our fear, so we can live life, right? Will Christmas ever come? That's the answer that, that, that can only be answered by you. But I am going to show you why most people will miss it, all right? And this is bonus time for you Christmas people because uh, I'm going to use traditional Christmas verses to do that, all right? You're all like, yeah, it's about time. I'm going to talk about one of the most famous people in the Bible besides Jesus, okay? If you've heard the Christmas story, you've heard of this guy, guaranteed, right? Uh, if you want to know his name, I can't give you the name, his name, because the Bible never even mentions his name at all. And what I want you to see about, it's not what this guy did. It's not that he's an evil guy, not that he's a monster or a mean person. It's more about what this guy didn't do, okay? And if you're just reading the story, if you're just coming in and, and, and just reading the Christmas story, you miss this completely, okay? So our story, story starts off, you got a very, very pregnant Mary. That rhymes, I didn't mean to do that. Very, very pregnant Mary. <laughs> I'm so immature, I apologize. <laughs> and you got a very, very tired Joseph, right? Amen, guys? Very pregnant equals guys are very tired. Just kidding, have fun in church, right? They are heading from Nazareth back to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. Because you have to go 
back to the point where you were born and raised and established, and that's where you had to pay your taxes. All right, so they're on this journey. What perfect timing, right? Now, like I said, I've never been nine months pregnant, never going to be, but I have been around a lot of women who are nine months pregnant, right? My wife, for one, both of her sisters, you guys, and I think nine-month-old pregnant women look adorable, right? They got the belly and they got the, the walk. I was going to say waddle, but that would have offended half of you, but, right? But they also got this look in their eye like, don't touch me, I'm nine months pregnant, right? Get this thing out of me now, right? <laughs> That's the look, especially in summertime, and they're all sweaty, and, you know, I'm like, you're so cute, and they're like, what? Nothing, I'm, yeah, praise God, I'm gone, right? <laughs> now, imagine being nine months pregnant and riding on a donkey for hours, right? Guys, imagine if your wife, nine months pregnant, riding on a, this is what's happening right now, right? Great visual illustration, fun times in the Bible, right? So, we hear about the shepherds, the angels not going there. We will in a couple weeks. A Savior, they say a Savior's born, don't be afraid. Uh, heavenly armies are worshiping at this time. You know, these shepherds are just like, oh my gosh, what's happening? The Savior's here. They declare peace on earth. It's great. Uh, talk more now in a couple weeks. And then we hear about the manger. Jesus is born in a manger. Are we all on the same page? You all heard that story, right? I don't know about you, but my wife wouldn't even let the dogs around my child until they were three right? And Jesus was born in the place where they eat, right? Now, we have boxers. That would have been really gross because they drool a lot. But you see what I'm saying? The Savior, the God of the universe, was born in place in a place where animals eat. That's a long way from his throne, amen? So let's read this. Luke 2, verses 6 and 7, and see if you catch this. And while they were there, a time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in the manger. We're going to stop right there, right? If you, everybody's probably heard the story, but imagine this for, you heard the story for the first time in your entire life, right? This is, this is all we're given. They're going, uh-oh, water breaks, we got to find the place. And then all of a sudden Luke says, so they found a manger and laid the baby in the manger. My first question would be, why? Right? Are you guys, is that tradition at your house to throw the baby where the animals eat? Right? It's weird. And this is where Luke answers a question before we even get a chance to ask it. And this is where the, one of the most famous people in the Bible is introduced. Luke says, she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in the manger. Why? There was no lodging available for them. Most of you guys heard there's no room for the, in the inn. You all heard that story? That's the why, right? Did you catch it? Did you catch the reason why most people just right there will miss Christmas? Some of you are going like, yeah, I got it, Pastor. Don't lie to me. Some of you are like, no. It's that innkeeper, man. He's a mean dude. He's evil. He, 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 he's cruel. He rents out rooms to everybody, and Jesus comes up, baby, hey, we're going to have a baby, and he says, no. Get out of here, right? I don't want Jesus in here. Go throw him where the animals eat, right? Scram. Then we all like, oh, poor Jesus, poor Mary, poor Joseph, right? This guy's a jerk, right? I got to admit, when I was a kid hearing the story, this is exactly how I pictured this guy. A big old burly dude. Mary's crying and Joseph's like, please, dude. And he's like, get out of here. You're bothering me. But this guy's not a monster, he, the Bible never says he's mean or nice. And the more I grow in Christ, I realize this guy's no monster. This guy is me. Remember, everybody's traveling. Everybody's paying taxes. Everybody's, it's a very busy time going back and forth and Black Friday's up and shopping and specials. 
right? Two goats for a dollar? I don't know what they're selling. But this guy is so, so busy and his life is so crowded and he's unwilling to sacrifice any of it to let Jesus into his doors. Told you it's a different Christmas story, right? So caught up in everything around him that he has no more room for Jesus. Does he see the need? Yeah. Does he probably feel a little guilty and bad? Yeah, who wouldn't turn a pregnant woman away? Carrie, you coming up? This guy missed Christmas. The very first Christmas. He missed it. This guy had the opportunity to hold Jesus in his arms before Jesus would die and raise from the grave and hold him in his arms. Do you realize this guy could have rewrote history if he would have stopped and thought about what was really going on, right? This guy, the amazing opportunity that he had to hold the Savior, right? And I know right now some of you saying, I would bet everything I have, but I won't because I'm a pastor and we're in church and we don't gamble. But I would bet everything we have. Some of you right now in your head are saying, Brant, you're being too hard on this guy. Right? Brant, the story wasn't written. Brant, he had no idea that was the Savior laying there. He had no idea that was Jesus. And I'd say, you know what I'd say? I'd say, you are exactly right, but we know who he is. And are we still shutting that door saying, sorry, no room? Yeah, I snuck up on you there. How'd you like that? I can't count how many Christmases I missed. I've been through 42 December 25ths. But I haven't been through 42 Christmases. I'm 42 years old. I'll explain that. Math is hard on Sunday. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in the manger. Why? Because there's no room of, no lodging available for him. That crowded in forever stands as as a symbol for our lives today. You with me? You're not bad people. The lost aren't bad people. There's some good people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. They're not monsters. I don't think anybody here hates Jesus. But I do believe there's probably some of us that don't let him in fully. You can use the manger. I got a manger. I got a place out back. I got a place that's not going to interfere with my daily life. I'll even come and visit you in the manger on Sunday. But I don't have any room in my personal space. Right? Jesus is Christmas. He said, I am the good news. I am the way for the broken to be healed. I am the key that unlocks the chains of captivity. I am the healing of the broken heart. I am the redeemer that restores the light in your life. I am the one that can put your family back together. I am the one that can heal the scars and unforgiveness of the past. I am the one that makes the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. I am the one. Moses says, if they don't believe me when I go into Egypt, who should I say sent me? And God says, tell him I am sent you. He is. How do I get past my finances? What do I do? I am. How do I stand back up after being knocked down so many times? He says, I am. I am. So today, you know, he is. He's done everything to make it possible for you to be free. He's done everything possible to make you live again. He has done nothing, nothing, nothing stands in the way except that closed door that you shut. Amen? Are you seeing this? So everybody, bow your heads with me today. 
And I play this thing in my head where I just put myself in the story. I want each and every one of you to picture yourself as that innkeeper today. Right? Life is busy. You don't have to imagine too hard on that. Life is overcrowded. You don't have to imagine on that. You're stressed. Life is, you know, you're just doing the best you know to do to get through. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Right? You got to understand back in those days, a meal was everything. We didn't have, they didn't have much, but that was hospitality. To open your door. It's more of a relationship thing. I'm going to let you into my space. I'm going to let you into my life. I'm going to let you into my family. I am going to become vulnerable for a second to give you a chance to come in. And Jesus says, I'm knocking. Will you answer? And today, you know, what will you do? What, what will you say? I don't... It doesn't matter. I almost said I didn't care, and that was the wrong choice of word. It doesn't matter if you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you strayed and walked away from Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you've fallen victim of addiction. It doesn't matter if you're consumed with anger, hurt, guilt. It doesn't matter. He stands and he knocks because he wants you to answer because he wants to come in. And that is Christmas. And I don't want you to miss your opportunity. So... Today, we're going to do the same thing. Same thing. I'm going to have Carrie play a song, and these altars are going to be open. And, and, and I just, I don't want you to miss it. Right? Like Paul said, man, it, it, it hurts. So I'm going to let Carrie play. I want you to sit there, and if, if you felt led by the Spirit to come up here, I would love to pray with you, right? We have a prayer team that's going to come up and pray with you. Uh, the worst thing you could do is hesitate. The worst thing you can do is allow the enemy to talk to you. The worst thing you could do is allow him to lie to you and say you got next week, all right? Today's your opportunity. Today he stands at the door. So, Carrie, you're, I'm going to let you have it.